Almighty God, graciously behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men to suffer death upon the cross. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first of our readings is from Isaiah, the 52nd chapter. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading comes from Hebrews in the fourth chapter. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a sin, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. The gospel reading this evening begins in the gospel of John in the 18th chapter, following which congregation will sing hymn 447 in a responsive way or in, in a verse-by-verse -verse way. The first reading from the gospel of John. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, 
where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Who are you, who are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke, Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Then the detachment of troops and the captain of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers who made a fire of coal stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet, and in secret I've said nothing. When you ask me, ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. When he said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed.
Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It's not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been granted to you from above. Therefore the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that's called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. 
But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified, so they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which in Hebrew is Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read his title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now there stood there by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled it with a sponge with sour wine, and they put it on a hyssop, and they put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit.
Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. And the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about a hundred pounds. And they took the body of Jesus, bound it in strips of linen, with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Grace and peace to you in Christ Jesus. This evening, as we consider our Lord's crucifixion, we also consider the seventh petition, which is the last of the petitions as we work our way through the Lord's Prayer. It's on page 324. If you would please open your hymnal to 324. What is the seventh petition? What does this mean? Dear fellow redeemed, could there be a more graphic answer to this petition to deliver us from evil than Jesus' death on the cross? Delivering us from evil had a price. Last Sunday in our readings, as Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the gospel records Jesus as saying, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Going to that cross and letting himself be killed was the moment in time which, according to Jesus, the world itself was judged and the devil was cast out. He not only delivered us from evil in general terms, but in specific terms, taking on the heart of the evil one himself, Satan, casting him out of the earth, facing an entire world of evil, delivering us even from the evil that resides within us. And yet, what Jesus says happened there 
and what faith tells us happened on that cross, not necessarily what our eyes see happening. I mean, look around you in the world today. What do you see? Evil is everywhere. People parading themselves around in the streets, marching to support everything from the murder of babies to the denigration of manhood to whatever cause they happen to be taking up where they can mock others and put them down, accusing others of being evil or ignorant. And what do you see in the world? Gross disrespect for authority. The support and promulgation of immorality. The failure of parents to teach kids basic things about respecting God and respecting others. I mean, the list goes on and on. Evil is everywhere, and it does seem to be getting worse every single day. And the evil inside us, that hasn't disappeared either, has it? We all struggle with desires and urges that are contrary to God and his word. We all let go of our spiritual discipline and things come out of us that are just plain sinful and break God's commandments. We all fail. I ask myself, if I sin less now that I'm in my 50s than I did 50 years ago when I was just a boy, because maybe what Jesus means by delivering us from evil is that we're gradually delivered from evil and gradually become less sinful. But the answer to this is no. I sin just as much now as I did then. If anything, maybe my sins are the worse, because now I know better and I should have more self-control, but I don't seem to. So all the evidence we see, everything our senses perceive tells us that evil is having a heyday and we are caught right in the middle of it. So how exactly did the events of Good Friday actually deliver us from evil or cast the devil out as Jesus says? Well, Jesus did actually cast the devil out on Good Friday. And he did actually deliver us from evil. But not in a way that eyes can see it or that our feelings can sense it. What Jesus did on his cross on Good Friday was to deliver us from the damning power of the devil and the sins within us. Jesus did not immediately stop the devil from tempting us or from promoting unbelief and evil in this world. He simply stopped the devil from the ability to drag our souls to hell and threaten us with eternal death. Luther puts it this way. He says the devil is like a vicious dog with sharp, angry teeth that threatens to kill everyone around him. Well, at the crucifixion, what Jesus did was pull the teeth of that dog. The devil on the outside still looks menacing. And he still barks up a storm and he can scratch with his claws. But he can't kill us anymore. Because his teeth are pulled, he's essentially powerless against us. Being delivered from evil through the cross of Jesus does not mean we're not going to sin. And it doesn't mean that we're not going to have any more temptations. It simply means that now we have a way to receive forgiveness from those sins and strength to stand against temptation. Good Friday gives us forgiveness in the eyes of God. There on that cross, the punishment that should have been paid by us for our lifetime of sin was paid by the one who never once yielded to temptation. He took our torment for our sin. He endured the hell and the separation from God all of us should have endured because of our sin. So our punishment has been carried out, not merely ignored, carried out in the flesh of God's own Son so that God could love us forever. 
that's delivering us from evil. And not only did Jesus love us enough to suffer such agony once on the cross, he has loved us enough to ensure that we have constant access to the forgiveness that was given to us there on his cross. He forgives us over and over again. He rescues us and re-rescues us from evil. At our baptisms, we were plunged into a stream of forgiveness that constantly washes over us. We were given a church where we can come every week and have Christ purge those sins from us once again through his word of grace and feed us with the very body and blood sacrificed on that cross for us. But of course, the problem remains that our sinful flesh is so dull, our minds so broken, that we can't really feel all the tremendous things Jesus has done. What we feel most in this life tends to be more our own weaknesses. There are times, of course, in life where we think we're making progress against this sin within us. We may go for a while without any serious sins, at least in our eyes, but then in a heartbeat, it comes back on us again, catches us, depressing. Sin is so stuck to us, we never actually break free in this lifetime. And again, there are other times when our feelings may tell us that we're doing an okay job breaking free. But it's just the simple fact of our nature that can't perceive what actually is. We can't perceive how sin infects the heart of our hearts. So the truth is, we cannot trust our feelings to determine whether or not we have been delivered from evil. But what we can tr trust is what happens right here on that cross. There, God overrides our feelings. There, he gives us the only thing capable of delivering us from evil and saving us eternally. So the faith God gives us clings to this cross and the Savior sacrificed for us there. Here in this terrible sight, we see blood and gore enough to cover the enormity of our sins. Those little sins we like to ignore, those big sins we cringe inside every time we think about, they are all covered in the blood of this one offered for us. And Jesus is such a savior that he forgives us not once or twice, but over and over again throughout our lifetimes. The power of his deliverance from evil, one on that cross, always outmatches the power of our flesh to fall into sin. So yes, we are delivered from evil. Yes, the ruler of this world has been cast down. Because our Savior died under God's wrath for us, and his love saves us. Thanks be to Jesus. Amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
we rise for prayers. Then following the prayers, we will read the reproaches. O Father of all mercy and love, we humbly come before you on this anniversary of Christ's death to thank you for taking pity on our lost condition and for loving us sinners so much that you delivered up your Son to the cross for us all because it pleased you to permit suffering and death to strike him instead of us. We have full pardon for our sins and release from all punishment. Grant to each of us a true and abiding faith by which our sin-weary souls may find the peace our Savior promised, a peace which comes from be, being reunited with you, our Heavenly Father. O Holy Spirit, whose gracious life-giving power has awakened us from death and united us by faith to our crucified Redeemer, grant that our sinful flesh might be crucified with Christ, that dying to sin we might live always unto him in righteousness, as you bestow on our hearts peace through the cross, help us also to take up and bear our own crosses after Christ, confessing his holy name. As it pleases you to keep us in the true faith, may it also please you to bring us the good news of Jesus' victory over death, not just to us, but to others, that together with us they may enjoy everlasting life and salvation. All to the glory of our Redeemer's name, who together with you and the Father is to be praised forevermore. Amen. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me. For I have raised you up from the prison house of sin and death, and you have delivered up your Redeemer to be scourged. For I have redeemed you from the house of bondage, and you have nailed your Savior to the cross, O my people. Holy Lord God, holy and mighty God, holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal, lead us not to bitter death, O Lord, have mercy. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me, for I have conquered all your foes, and you have given me over and delivered me to those who persecute me. For I have fed you with my word and refreshed you with living water, and you have given me gall and vinegar to drink, O my people.
Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? My people, is this how you thank your God, O my people? Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and grace. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who accomplished the salvation of mankind by the tree of the cross that where death arose, their life also might rise again, and that the serpent who overcame by the tree of the garden might likewise by the tree of the cross be overcome. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he taught us. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.